creepy. When you sit next to Don McMahon, you hear things no one else hears. <laughs> when this was all over, he goes, yeah! <laughs> By the way, you don't know this, but that was a John Dill arrangement on the organ. John arranged it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for your prayers for Cynthia and me while we were away dealing with COVID. You know, after over two years of steering clear of it, we thought it would leave us alone, but it sneaked in the back door somehow and, and got into our lives, and it is, uh, it is a no fun experience. I had it about 14 days, she had it over 17. So it was quite a, a journey, and, and we missed you terribly, I, I can assure you. I have a love affair with this place, and, and I'm, I miss the music. Uh, I can do without the preaching, but I miss the music. <laughs> it was uh, coming back and hearing this is just reminding me of just how marvelous we, we have it here, and how grateful we are for these who practice well and uh, cultivate their, their skill, their art, and uh, vocal as well as instrumental. How grateful we are for our wonderful worship. And I want to say thank you also to Jonathan Murphy for stepping in uh, to begin with. At the last minute, he was willing to do that, and I'm very grateful that, that he did that. And, I understand he clarified things on the minor prophets. That's good. That's a, that's a good thing. And I'm sure his teaching was outstanding as always. Thank you for visiting with us. If you are a guest of ours today and you're not usually sitting in that seat, we thank you for filling it today. Thank you for being with us online. If you're among those who journey here electronically. We're glad you're a part of our time together. Anytime you're able to come and visit, literally you're welcome to be here. You know we'd always love to have you. We enjoy uh, setting apart the time of announcements by doing it on the screen, and that way we're able to get them communicated clearly and in a way that you'll remember a little better when we hear and see these things. And today we have a little surprise for you. Our, our choir of the future is on the uh, screen today. So listen carefully and you'll see how the choir would sound if it didn't practice often together. <laughs> Here they are, a little younger in life. So let's listen to what they have. In God's eyes, children aren't so little. They are His future followers, leaders, teachers. And when you serve here at Stonebriar, you are the connecting point to that wonderful future. You can show these kids that Jesus truly does love them and is active in their lives. With an hour or two of your time, through a smile, a story, or a song, the Lord will use you to nurture the faith of His little ones. Find your way to make a difference at stonebriar.org slash serve. The Bible tells me so. Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities, was published in 1858. The novel, the story takes place in both London and Paris, pre and during the French Revolution, which started in 1789. One of my favorite scenes in the book is in part three, involves two key people that are in the novel, Charles Darnay and Sidney Carton. Charles Darnay is a good man. He's a, a British aristocrat, happens to be visiting Paris when he is falsely arrested 
falsely accused of insurrection against the French government, and his punishment is death by the guillotine. His friend is also a lawyer, Sidney Carton, and uh, Sidney uh, presents his defense uh, to no avail. The night before Charles is to be executed, uh, Sidney visits him in prison. Uh, interestingly, uh, they are very similar in appearance. They are the same height, same facial features. Couldn't tell them apart in a crowd. Sidney talks Charles during those hours that they are together in trading clothes with him. So they, they exchange garments such that uh, the person that walks out of the prison that evening is not the same one that walked in. And the next morning, the one who is led to the guillotine is not the one who was guilty, but his friend has taken his place. And uh, right there in the novel, Charles Dickens refers uh, opaquely to that great scripture in John 15, 18 that says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. This exchange of garments is referred to by theologians as the divine exchange, and that is Christ was willing to take on our, metaphorically speaking, garments, and we could take on His. The Bible says this, He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we, in turn, might inherit the righteousness of Christ. <laughs> the divine exchange. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that awe-inspiring? Our first hymn is entitled, His Robes for Mine. As we sing it, pay close attention to every thought, and uh, we will be overcome with gratitude, the awe and wonder of Christ taking our place. Would you stand, please?
How easy to fall into the trap of cliches and just predictable, empty talk. Even as a group of Christians, how important it is that we, that we go deep. It was Tozer who wrote, May not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit of 
skipping through the corridor of the kingdom like children in the marketplace, always chattering about everything, and pausing to learn the true value of nothing. My hope for us as a body of believers is that we stop the chattering about everything. And then we learn to tap the brakes, to pause and listen a little better so that we might grow a little deeper. The psalmist writes, you have shown me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The Lord wants us to go deeper, ever deeper in our walk with him. It doesn't mean we're detached from others. It, it means our attachment is more meaningful. And that's rare when your life is filled with chatter, just shallow talk. Our time in the minor prophets will deepen us if we let that happen. It is an automatic. God reveals his word to deepen our walk with him, to grow us up. So my goal always is to find within these great little books that message that's within the lines but often isn't obvious. So it is with Zechariah. We've come to the next to last of the 12 minor prophets. I want to read for you a few excerpts from the New Living Translation, except the second reading will be from the New American Standard because it is a better rendering of what the scripture is saying. So if you found your way to the almost the very end of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, next week will be Malachi. Locate Zechariah and find verse 1 of chapter 1. When you do, please stand with me for the reading of the scriptures. In November of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave this message to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah and grandson of Edo. I, the Lord, was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, say to the people, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies says, return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Now turn ahead to chapter 4. And you'll find in verses 6 and 7, verses you've quoted, but perhaps did not know where they were located. That can easily happen. 4, verse 6. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring out the top stone with shouts of grace 
grace to it. One verse out of chapter 9, please. Verse 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, and he's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's calf. Prediction regarding the triumphal entry, you'll recall. And then finally, from the last chapter, <clears throat> verse 3. looking far ahead to the future, ahead even in our times, then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will split apart making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. Verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day there will be one Lord, his name alone will be worshipped. Bow with me as we pray. We come to you, our Father, our King, our God. the one who with the morning sunrise reminds us that your mercies are new. On this day, there are new mercies. Every day brings new mercies. How we need that. Where we often find ourselves at a loss to explain the reason we're going through what we're going through. We need your mercy to help us figure that out. We need your mercy to help us endure when we cannot figure it out. Comfort us, we pray, in days of sickness and times of loss. There are those this very moment who grieve the loss of those who meant the world to them. Comfort them, we pray. May your mercy mixed with your comfort bring a ray of new hope and reassurance that you never forget us. You care about us deeply. And your love never fails. How deep is the Father's love for us? How deep fathomless, bottomless. On this day, we revel in it. Thank you for it. Give us a childlike faith where we trust you without knowing where you're leading or why the direction is in this way. And quiet us 
in the process of waiting and trusting. Minister today through these uh, chapters of Zechariah, may we meet him as a man, not simply as a prophet, but as one like us. who at a time in his life needed to be reminded, you're never forgotten. Never forgotten. Now, Lord, it's our privilege to give you our gifts, and we do so confidently and generously and joyfully. Thank you that we have our occupations. Thank you we're able to make a living and, and from that we're able to give as you have prospered us. How great has been your provision. Meet our needs, we pray, as a church, as a ministry, as we reach out beyond our walls and our own community to this world in its desperate need for the Savior. I ask this through Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated.
A little less than 35 years ago, an 8.3 earthquake leveled the country of Armenia. In a four minute period of time, 30,000 died. The land, as you can imagine, was filled with grief, devastation, and chaos. Residential areas that were not destroyed included households who were unable to locate family members and, and friends ever. On one of those places, there was, there, there was a father who suddenly remembered his son, Armand, who was at school when the, when the earthquake hit. And once he made sure his wife was securely safe in their home, he left and went as quickly as he could through the rubble to see if he might be able to locate his boy. On his way to the school, or what once used to be the school, he, he remembered that he had promised Armand that no matter what, he would be there for him throughout his life. He would never forget him. And here he stood with tears in his eyes, staring at what was once a school building that was absolutely flat as a pancake. He suddenly remembered that uh, his boy's classroom was located on the right rear corner of what was once this building. So he stumbled over large chunks of concrete and stone, rocks, hoping to find his way to an area near where his boy might be, all the while hoping against hope that his boy would, would be alive. He began with his own hands to dig and to pull away the, uh, the, the big chunks of concrete and well-meaning parents and, and some people from the neighborhood came over and said to him, please, it's too late. Please, they're all dead. We cannot ever find them. Go, go back home. He ignored their, their words and, and in a matter of moments, the fire chief and a policeman walked over and, and urged him to leave and, and reminded him that fires were breaking out and explosions would soon begin. It was dangerous to be there for him as well as for others. As they said to him, we'll take care of the rescue. If it's possible to locate anyone, we'll locate them. Courageously, he proceeded all alone and began to dig. Eight hours, 12 hours, all through the night, 24 hours. And at the 38th hour, exhausted, broken, weeping, he heard the faint voice of his boy. Armand, Armand, he shouted. Dad, 
Dad, I, I, I knew you would be here. Uh, there were 33 of us, now there are 14. I've told them that if you lived through this, you would come because you had promised you would always be there for me. You would never forget us. And I know that if you'd come to save me, you'd save them. Come on out, son. No, he said, let them come out first. We're hungry, we're thirsty. Some are crippled, I know. Let them out first. I knew you would come. If you were alive, I knew you would be here. I knew you would keep your promise. What a great story, a true story. Did you realize, did you know that there are over 7,400 promises in the Bible? Someone has literally counted the promises. Admittedly, they're not all for us, but many are. Most of them given by the Lord our God, saying to us in the promise, I will never forget you. I will be there for you. Regardless of where you find yourself, Regardless of the mess you have made of your life, regardless of the destruction that's gone on around you, I will be there. I will never forget you. As I use those words, I'm reminded of a promise that you may have never seen before. And I'm quoting from Isaiah 49 that begins with a question. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, hear this, behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your ways are continually before me. You say, that's in the Bible? That's in the Bible. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Put it in the margin of your Bible, right where you have it open. Check it out later. Interestingly, the, the, the verse uses what theologians sometimes refer to as an anthropomorphism, meaning human words to describe the working or the ministry of God in our lives. Uh, for example, God has no hands and feet like we do. We refer to the face of God. He doesn't have a face. God is a spirit. He's everywhere at once, all around us, omnipresent, all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowledge, omniscient. But to help us understand how he thinks of us, words are used that we would use of one another, humanly speaking. And if you ever know anything about your own anatomy, you know how the palms of your hands appear. You know the lines that have been inscribed since birth on your hands. The Lord, using that same analogy, says, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands, meaning I always have you on my heart. I will never forget you, no matter what no matter what. What a reassuring thought. And I, I know, even though I do not know most of you personally, I know that in a group this size and among those viewing online, I know that many of you 
have known the feeling of being alone. Uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge in his uh, marvelous uh, classic Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner writes it well. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, not a soul took pity on me in my agony. Maybe you felt that when you lost your partner in life. You felt that when your child passed, or your mother or father, or both. I know a woman who was closely attached to her dad, so close in her early years, and even while a, a young girl got word that her father had been killed on the highway not far from their home, and she said, though she's getting up in years, I will never forget the moment I was told, and to this day, I miss him. She knows, like you know, like I know, how easy to feel that we've been forgotten, overlooked, even maybe abandoned. What does this have to do with Zechariah? Well, you may be surprised to hear it has everything to do with him. Zechariah is an interesting book. I have read it several times in the preparation for this message. And uh, each time I've read it, I've realized I, I, I really don't want to get into the analysis of this apocalyptic literature. I don't want to bore the audience with a lot of details about all the swirls and the things that are, uh, appear in the book, the, the, the flaming scrolls and the, and the flying angels and on and on. What about the man himself? So I've chosen to do something I've not done with any of the other prophets. I've chosen to look at Zechariah biographically. Let's consider him as a man. Not so much as a prophet, though we will, we will touch on that, but as, a, as an individual just like you, just like me. First, his, his, his name is of interest. Yahweh remembers. That's what Zechariah means. It's another way of saying from the Hebrew, the Lord will never forget. Did you know there are 28 men named Zechariah in the Bible? I, I didn't know that. I could name a few, but I had no idea there were over 20. Seems as though the Lord wants us to remind ourselves he will never forget us. So dotted from here to there in places of the Bible, there are, there are people named the Lord remembers. Also, Zechariah is the longest of the minor prophets, 14 chapters. Interestingly, isn't it interesting, isn't it, that, that the Lord chooses the longest of the minor prophets to carry the message, you will never be forgotten. Now, when I read that and when I began to focus and meditate on that, I, I wondered why. Why is it that Zechariah mentions more about Messiah than any other prophet except Isaiah? What is it about Zechariah that caused him to take such an interest in the thought that 
we will never be forgotten. His son will never be forgotten. That the promises made will be promises kept. Well, when you look at his genealogy, which is brief, you find it rather interesting that his father is named only a time or two, and that's it. Berechiah is his name. We know nothing of him. His mother is not mentioned. Perhaps he was orphaned. His grandfather is mentioned several times. Edo, I-D-D-O. We know little of him except he's often attached to his grandson, Zechariah. Maybe it's the preacher in me, but I would like to think that Granddad Edo had a major role in the life of grandson Zechariah. Just as you, a grandparent, may have a major role in your grandchild's life. Never sell that short. I will unveil a part of my own past. I, I was... Uh, uh, not planned, uh, and, and so I often felt not wanted by my parents. Uh, my, my mother's favorite, and favoritism was not hidden in our family, uh, my mother's favorite was our uh, brother, Orville, and my dad's favorite was my sister, Lucy, a very gifted, capable lovely people, but <laughs> hi, I, here am I, uh, but they didn't really have much time for me, but my grandfather did. My maternal grandfather, L. O. Lundy, Justice of the Peace in the little town of El Campo, Texas, for some reason known only to God, like Edo with Zechariah, Elo Lundy took an interest in this grandson. Early on, he became for me uh, my most significant adult and point of reference. He loved me. He talked with me. He listened to me. He helped me. On occasion, he would correct me. Uh, he was the one who taught me how to drive. <laughs> and I drove his 39 Ford into the side of the garage, and I missed the door. And, <laughs> and I, I began to cry, and he said, just back it up, son. Let's try again. He says, I can get more fenders, but I, I can't get more grandsons. And I thought, man, I'm going to try that again. And I, I, I didn't, and I, I, I didn't run into the garage the next. Of course, there wasn't a fender there to run into, so <laughs> it was a little easier the second. But things like that taught me to fish, taught me to hunt, took an interest in me. As I got into school, I found that there were individuals who could be mentors for me. By my high school years, early high school years, I stuttered so badly I couldn't get out a sentence without real serious stuttering. And there was a, a high school drama teacher named Richard Nemi, who had come from Broadway, of all things, to pour himself into the lives of high school students in, uh, in theater and debate and drama. Uh, he asked me to be a part of his drama class. I, I, I had no idea he really meant that seriously. But he said to me, I, I will teach you how to speak in public. Uh, he did. As a matter of fact, we spent that whole summer of my sophomore year as he worked with me doing speech therapy, I realize now. He taught me to pace my words, 
He said, your mind is, is running ahead uh, of your mouth. And he said, you've got to coordinate them. I now have the opposite problem uh, <laughs> now that I learned to do that. And I've got to be careful not to let my mouth run ahead of my, of my brains. But he said to me, you, you, you've really got it. And I thought, whatever it is, I'm not sure I want it. But he said to me, you could have the lead in our senior play, which is the most foreign thought to me I could imagine. Now, the reason I'm going down this little rabbit trail is to explain to you the value of a mentor. Some individual, pause for a moment and think back. If Zechariah did that, he would do that with Edo. You see, Zechariah was also a child of, of the exile, born in Babylon. It's like saying born in the Holocaust. And Edo was there. As an adult, he had been brought into the exile out of Jerusalem, but Zechariah was born there. Edo helped Zechariah find his way, learn about life, and become the man he wanted to be. As a matter of fact, in 538 BC, Edo and Zechariah, along with others, made their way back to Jerusalem, thanks to a king, no longer king of Babylon, but another king that looked with favor on the Jews, allowing them to return. And there was Zechariah finding security and refuge in Edo, his grandfather, once again. Which meant he was a contemporary with Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, and even a prophet. And he stepped in for that prophet and became the second voice for the one who urged the people to build the temple. Haggai, who was an older man by then, and Zechariah came as a younger man. But I think his security came from Edo, his grandfather. And by the way, I'm not through with my story. When I got to seminary by the grace of God, I realized a major benefit of the school is not just truth learned from textbooks, but truth taught through life, from prof to student, from teacher to learner. It was my privilege when I got to Dallas Seminary, there were 19 professors at the time. It's much larger now, but back then it was small enough. We were able to really get to know the profs. And one of my desires was to know several of them very well. Uh, I will never forget uh, being close to a number of the profs. We even had them in our little apartment where uh, they were involved in the Wives Fellowship of Ministry that Cynthia began while we were at the school. And here we were sitting at a little table. I mean, the apartment was so small, you had to go outside to change your mind. But here we were sitting at the table with this prop, listening to him, learning from him. Which brings up the subject you cannot train a person of God without people of God rubbing up against them. You can never learn to be a good minister of the gospel online any more than you can learn to be an excellent surgeon online or military leader online. You need to be with others who are veterans, older, wiser, brighter minds, deeper lives. 
Uh, Cynthia and I believe that from the very beginning and how grateful we are to this day. Uh, in fact, while I was a seminary student, one of my mentors was Ray Stedman in Palo Alto, California, and I realized uh, in the privilege of being asked to be an intern with Ray, the, the invaluable benefit of being near the man, watching how he held the Bible, listening to him as he delivered his messages from the scriptures, learning from him as he worked through his own struggles in life. Life with life, people with people. Now, Zechariah had Edo. Think back for a moment whom you had. Maybe a coach while you were a student on a team. Maybe a teacher. Maybe a, a neighbor. Perhaps a pastor. Or maybe a youth pastor who really was on your level and helped you understand the walk of faith and help put the language of the scriptures into everyday life. How invaluable that transfer of life was. And uh, Prof. Hendricks used to teach us, you can never separate truth from the one teaching it to you. To this day, when I come to certain passages, I think of certain teachers who taught me the scriptures. Matter of fact, when I graduated, I had four opportunities. I could go to Dayton, Ohio and be a pastor of a church. I could, I could go to Chattanooga, Tennessee and be an assistant pastor in a Presbyterian church. I could go to Castro Valley, California and be a youth leader and uh, also at the same time, a uh, minister of music, of all things. And then the other fourth was I could remain in Dallas and continue to serve under the tutelage of one of my major professors from the seminary, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, which I chose to do. And for four and a half years, I had the inestimable privilege of living my life in the shadow of Dwight Pentecost. What a wonderful man of God, now gone to glory. But I had the chance to know him intimately. What a privilege was mine. And uh, he was faithful. He was competent. He was wise. He cared about me. He had a way of understanding the ministry far more than I did. He took time for me. How, how much better prepared I was when stepping on my own into ministry, having had time with a teacher that had taught me to speak in public with, with an intern, internship and a, and a seasoned pastor with professors, 19 of them, who had poured their lives in, into mine and, and other students. Uh, what a privilege. Zechariah would say, so it was with Edo, my, my grandfather, and the other older men he was around. Don't sell short your role as an aging individual and the value of your presence in the lives of those who are younger. And you, you may just be in your 40s, 30s or 40s, but there are those much younger than you and they long for someone who can help them find their way. Perhaps they're in a home where they're not understood and they aren't appreciated. 
You're the Edo for them. You're the L.O. Lundy that was true in my life or the Richard Nemi. Zechariah reminds me of the value of that and the ministry he had as he began to write and make people aware of the prophetic truths, the prophetic truths of the scriptures, his grasp of that was deeper, I believe, because of the impressionable years he spent with a grandfather who I'm sure poured his life into him. Zechariah's book is a mixture of apocalyptic literature and interesting narrative filled with prophecies. And as he writes, he makes us aware that the Lord will keep his promise. In fact, he'll come back in what is known as the triumphal entry. And in chapter 9, he even describes him as coming back on the, on the back of a donkey. And that's exactly the way it happened when you read in the Gospels. When you get to the millennial kingdom, he reminds us that the promises made to Israel are not forgotten because the Lord will come. He will stand on the Mount of Olives and it will split at the touch of his feet. And the, he, will, he will rule as King of kings and Lord of lords over all the earth. He will be the one king whom people will worship. How marvelous. And we have Zechariah to thank for that revelation. The depth of truth that comes from him. Do you need the reminder today that you're never forgotten? Have you been raised in a place where you weren't seen as all that significant. Perhaps your folks didn't take time for you. Or you couldn't name that many individuals who helped you along the way, but you can name one or two or three. Or you may have grown up feeling that you were somewhat abandoned and overlooked. I used to lie in my bed at night thinking, why am I here? Why on earth was I a part of this family? I had no clue what God's plan for me was. And the reason I go into that is that you might understand the value I found in scriptures like we're in, where I was reminded through the promises he has inscribed me on the palm of his hands. My ways have continually been before him. You only have known me in a segment of my life. You never knew me as a young man. You, you, you never knew me as a teenager. Thank the Lord you didn't know me as a teenager. You've only known me as an adult. But God's hand was on my life. You didn't know when the decision was made to stay in Dallas and to serve Dwight Pentecost and to be an assistant to him. What a privilege it was to learn from him. I remember an elder coming to my little office there at Grace Bible Church where we were serving. And, and uh, he said to me, I want to talk to you in all honesty. And I said, good. Good. Uh, I'm, I'm, please do. And he said, uh, you know, Chuck, when you preach, the church is full. Uh, and the reason it's full is not because of you. It's because they came thinking Dr. Pentecost was going to be preaching <laughs> that Sunday. And then he made a profound statement. I'll never forget it. Yours is a borrowed popularity. Isn't that a great line? I've never forgotten it. He said, when you stand to preach, what you don't know is that they all came expecting to hear one far wiser 
much more in depth than you'll ever uh, be at this stage of your life. But he said, we love you, we appreciate you, but I never want you to think, Chuck, that what has happened here is because of you. You're here because of what God has done in the life of another. Now that may sound to you like a, a, an offensive statement. It, it wasn't at all. And it was said in love, as Jim talked to me, like a father would a son. I'm grateful for it. And to this day, I realize that it is a privilege to speak to any group that gathers. Because I don't know the details of your life. I'm able to address broadly the things that are addressed in the scriptures. And you must apply them to you. I urge some of you to become mentors. Not just people growing older and, and developing your own family, but reaching out to some who are searching for hope and help as they try to find their legs and get underway in their walk with Christ. We all need others in our life. As I was coming toward the end of my message, uh, late Friday evening, I began to think about it. I remembered a story, and I couldn't remember where it was found until I began to think on it. And it was in a book that I got back in 1969, of all things. And after a search that took me hours, ultimately, to find it, I came across the story that I want to close with. I want you to hear this story. Charles Allen tells of a boy who lost both father and mother when he was 11. Only 11 years old and orphaned. He was told that his aunt was willing to take him into her house. Late one night, a man came on horseback so that they might ride together to the aunt's home, which would become his new home. It was a long drive, a, a, a long ride. And so on the way, he spoke to the man who was in the saddle. He said, will she be there for me? Try to picture this. Oh, yeah, she'll be there waiting for you. She'll wait up for you. Doesn't matter what time we get there. Well, I like living with her. Oh, my son, you've fallen into good hands. Will she love me? Really love me? Oh, she has a big heart. She will love you. Will I have my own room? He asks. Yes. She's already made arrangements for you. You'll have your own room. Will she let me have a puppy? Oh, she has many things planned for you, many surprises. You'll enjoy all of them. It must have been two or three o'clock in the morning when they finally arrived. Picture this. The light was on. The aunt was standing, waiting on the front porch. He slid off the horse and she hugged him to herself and took him into her home. That was where he grew up. It was always a place of enchantment for him because of her. 
it awed him that such a replacement existed, that there was a place for him, someone waiting up for him. He had left a house of death, and she had been she had given him a home of security, a home all his own, with his own room, a place where he could grow up and learn and become the man he was meant to be. He did that and later entered into the ministry of the gospel. He moved away, and many years later, she, with quavering hands, wrote him a letter about her failing health and faith, wondering about her own future. He wrote back these words. Years ago, when I was just a boy, I left a house of death, not knowing where I was to go, whether anyone would ever care for me, whether it was the end of me or whether I would have a future. The ride was long and rugged and the driver encouraged me along the way. Finally, he pointed out the light and there you were, as we entered the front yard and you embraced me and you took me by the hand into my own room that you had prepared for me. After all these years, I still cannot believe it. How you did all of this for me, I was expected. I was loved. I felt so safe in my room, so welcome. Thanks to you, it was my room. Now, dear Auntie, it's your turn. And as one who has tried it out, I'm writing to you to let you know someone is waiting up for you. Your room is all ready. The light will be on and the door will be open. You'll drive into the yard and don't worry, Auntie. You are expected and you will be loved. I know that for sure, for once I saw God standing in the doorway at your home long, long ago. I don't know where you are in this stage of your life. I don't know why it was God led me to prepare Zechariah in these words, but I know this. He led me to remind all of us we will never be forgotten. He's there for us. He tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the door, and whoever enters that door has everlasting life. So if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, this is a moment for you. He will be there not only now, and throughout your earthly life, he will be there when it's your turn to go. And you feel alone. And you're not sure about your own faith. He'll be there. He has a place prepared for you. You may have wandered far away from him. Today's the day to return. He's there for you. He will never forget you, ever, because he loves you with an everlasting love.
Bow your head with me, will you please? Just for a moment, sit quietly. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would never perish but have everlasting life. That's your promise. Claim it today. If there's never been a time in your life when you've said to the Lord, today I'm coming home. I've had enough of life on my own. I need you. And I need the, what you can provide because I cannot provide it for myself. I want to leave this house of death and I want to come to the place of life that you have provided for me. Thank you for never forgetting me. Thank you, Christ, for coming into my life. Let us hear from you if you trusted in the Lord Jesus today. We're here to help you along the journey from earth to heaven, which is the place that has our room reserved just for us. Dear Father, I thank you for your Son, Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you that you never turn us away when we turn to you, just like Zechariah writes, if you return to me, I will return to you. Hear the prayers of those this day who turn from themselves to you who leave their world of death, selfishness, and all the things that serve themselves as they turn to you and trust in you. And give them the assurance that you're there and the light is on and you're waiting with open arms. Thank you, Father, for promising this and for keeping your word that where you are, there we will be also. In the name of Christ, we thank you. Everyone said, Amen. I'm so thankful you joined us this morning, and I'd love for you to worship with us again next Sunday. 
If you'd like to learn more about our ministries and how you can connect either online or in person, visit stonebriar.org slash welcome. Have a great week, friends.